Hello, this is Sarah Soil the Plant, and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about alocasia, specifically my collection of alocasia and the care required to keep these plants. I'm fairly new to alocasia. I've only had them for about a year. I've been keeping them healthy for the most part. I'm actually gonna go over the collection of alocasia first and then care at the end. If you wanna jump around to different plants or different topics, I will put timestamps down below for you. As far as the order, I'm gonna go chronologically from the plant I've had the longest to the plants I've had the least amount of time. And that means we are going to start with this little alocasia right here. It was labeled as a mandalay and I still haven't confirmed whether or not this is officially a mandalay or not. It's very much giving me Alocasia Amazonica vibes or poly. I believe Amazonica is the right name for it, but it goes by both. But at least it was labeled as a mandalay when I bought it. I also watered all of my Alocasia yesterday. So if they're a little drippy or wet or something, I I'm, I'm apologize. This one in particular, I got last winter sort of around the same time as now because I did want to start dabbling in alocasia and I wanted to get something cheap and something local so that I could try my hand at caring for them and seeing how it goes. And this one has been doing pretty well. I feel like alocasia in general just kind of lose leaves when you bring them home or they're prone to. But if you give them the right conditions, they start growing and doing pretty well. This one actually has a decent amount of leaves on it and hasn't lost a leaf in a while. Like, knock on wood, but I haven't lost a leaf in a while. And I feel like every subsequent leaf that comes out is just even more amazing. One of my favorite things about this particular alocasia is not even the front, because like I said, the front kind of looks like a poly slash Amazonica. And so it's kind of given me more like standard alocasia vibes. But what I love about this alocasia in particular is the backsides. So that is what the backsides look like. They're nice and veiny and have that cool purple with the kind of, you know, pattern in there that looks very veiny or, you know, got that dinosaur shell vibe to it. I definitely think they are very cool looking. And then you've got, of course, the fronts that look about like that. And that is the Alocasia Mandalay. The next one I bought is going through some things, but I'll introduce you anyway. And that is the Alocasia Tiny Dancer. This one is a super different Alocasia because usually Alocasia have those like big, beautiful shield style leaves. And this one, it's actually, you get more leaves, but they're smaller. Now this one is going through some things. We've got a lot of browning going on and sort of decomposition on some of these older leaves. And when I went to inspect it, I did find bugs. So I treated for it yesterday and I actually am treating all of my alocasia because they're all near each other. Hopefully all of my plants don't degrade like crazy after I film this video. I've also got an awesome new leaf coming in right here, but this one is more of a plain alocasia. It's more plain green. It doesn't have super cool veining or colors or patterns. It's actually connected at the bottom down here. So it literally, if you put water in here, it'll actually settle in that little cup at the bottom. And it's so cute. And that little cup at the bottom is where a lot of bugs like to hide. So make sure you double check them. That's a good place to look if you're looking for pests on these. But you know, it's obviously called a tiny dancer because it definitely has this sort of like ethereal dancing quality to it. And I do like the growth pattern on the bottom of the stems. It just looks very symmetrical and very intentional. And it's a very, very nice alocasia. And I really like this. I've seen them since and almost considered buying another one because I do like it a lot. That's a little ridiculous. And so <laughs> I didn't buy more than one of these. Generally speaking, you can find these around. They're not insanely common. You're probably not gonna find these at you know a grocery store, but a lot of more specialty nurseries will carry stuff like this. So it's not unheard of that you want, like I don't think if you wanted to find one, I think you could find one, but it's not gonna cost you an arm and a leg. It should be in your like standard houseplant price range. It's just kind of harder to come by. But I really like this one. And I think this one also is a little bit more tolerant than some of the other ones. I'll get more into that when I get into care, but this one generally doesn't need quite as much light. And I was actually burning my leaves where I when I put this where my other alocasia are, 
it was actually burning and getting really sun stressed and everything so i actually moved it to a darker section and it's been doing so much better growing new leaves constantly you can see it kind of has a little bit of a lean and that's because i don't spin it nearly enough so it's kind of pushing towards the light. The next newest ones, I technically got them about like a week or two apart. I'll show you them both because they are the same plant. And that is my Alocasia fry deck. This is the bigger of the two fry decks I have. This is the one that's doing a little bit better than the other one. And I'll show you the other one in a second. I have been seeing some of this browning on the tips of the ears up here on some of the bigger ones. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's due to me underwatering it. All of my leaves recently, so this one, and this one were kind of in the peak of summer, but since fall and winter started, the leaves that are a little bit newer are a little bit smaller than they were before. This one is the, um, is that the newest leaf? Yeah, this is the newest leaf and it is like itty bitty compared to this one. I think that's partially because I'm not watering it enough, but also it's winter, so it's not getting quite as much light as it would normally, but it is still putting off new growth. I've got, let's see if I can, ooh, this around. This leaf right here is coming out, so it's certainly by no means dormant. It is still growing even in the thick of winter, but the growth I'm seeing is a bit smaller. So the thing I love about the Fridex and why it's probably one of my favorite, I mean it's definitely one of my favorite alocasias, but probably almost one of my favorite plants, period, is because you have this beautiful like white almost veining. It's, it's actually, you know, like a light green to white color. So it's white in the center and then kind of has a little gradient into the leaf where it almost looks like it's glowing neon white up against this really beautiful dark matte, almost velvety blackish green. And it is just so striking. And when you look at it, you know, symmetrically and everything, it is just, it's truly stunning. Like it's got a similar leaf shape compared to this mandalay here, but at the same time, like the colors are so very different. Most alocasia don't have this matte coloring to it. They almost always are gonna be glossy, at least the ones that I have and I've seen. They're almost always either glossy or like a standard like shiny leaf color. They're not usually matte like this. At least in my eyes, it's special and unique. It does grow really well if you give it the right conditions. But if you don't give it the right conditions, what can happen is what happened to my other Alocasia fry deck. And that is this guy right here. This Alocasia, I did not water nearly enough and it basically lost every single leaf. So these are my winter growth leaves and those are the only two leaves I have. I feel like most people's Alocasias or fry decks, but Alocasia generally, a lot of them look like this where they are very minimal and have fewer leaves and don't get all bushy and big. And there's honestly nothing wrong with that. A lot of alocasias that go dormant in the winter will kind of look like this, but this is by no means an unhealthy plant. This is just one that wished I gave it more water about three, four months ago and ended up, you know, losing leaves and it'll recover probably in the spring and summer. But for right now, this is my second alocasia fry deck. The next alocasia on my list here is going to be my cupria which is this lovely gem right here. This is the one that I ordered from Root Greenhouse, which is an international company. So it actually shipped from overseas and came to me last spring in March. Not, both of these leaves were made by me. All of the leaves that it came with have since fallen off. So both of these are a little testament to my setup. The Cupria is very much a love it or hate it plant. I mean, you might think it's interesting, but not really cute. It does have a very insect bug-like quality to it. And it's hyper glossy, has big divots, not divots, but big sort of recesses in the leaves to make sort of a true texture. That is not an illusion. It is a real texture on the leaf. This is like the six pack abs of alocasia. Like what are those things called where you wash your clothes and you like rub it up and down when you're washing in a bucket or whatever. I don't even know what those are called. I can't think of what they're called, but like this kind of resembles that. One thing of note about the cuprias 
is the back sides are deep mahogany as comparison to like the front of the leaf is more green. Sometimes they can get a little on the gray side. This one very much kind of has that sort of jewel tone color to it. And this one is just like a straight up true green. I think it just kind of honestly depends what leaf color comes out. Cause when this one came out, it was green from the jump. And then this one came out and it was like this gray to purpley red, bl like bluish color. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just naming every color in the rainbow because it kind of looks like an oil slick where depending on what light you look at it, it'll kind of give you a different sheen. Like it's, it's, it's a super cool plant. But I'm hoping this gets a little bit more big and bushy. I do have a teeny tiny little growth point right there. It is like minuscule. It's just like teeny, but it's coming up. So hopefully we'll have another leaf on the way soon. So the last couple alocasia that I got, I got all at the same time. So I will just start with the alocasia silver dragon, which is this one right here. It has a very similar style of growth to the cupria, where it's very much a shield look, except instead of having that heavily ridged oil slick look, the insect look, the ribs, this one is a little more subtle and it has a grayish, greenish, blue tint to the leaf, which is why it's called Silver Dragon. I think these ones are becoming a little bit easier to find. I've been seeing them online a lot more and I think the prices are actually coming down on these. So if you have your heart set on them, you should be able to get one about this size for like between 50, 60, 70 bucks, somewhere in there which while that's expensive as far as regular plants go for more expensive exotic house plants, it's fairly reasonable. And these ones can grow pretty easily. I've got a new leaf that is almost about to unfurl. It is definitely size-wise equivalent to the last one that opened up. This one was actually unfurling when I bought it. So the fact that the first leaf I'm getting while it's in my care is about the same size is a good sign. And on the stem here, it actually does have a teeny tiny little one that's gonna be coming up next after this one is done. I've only had this plant for three months, four months, three months maybe. Um, I didn't end up losing any leaves when I brought it home, which is a tiny miracle, honestly. So it's already rebounded and starting to grow. I feel like alocasias, they've got a sort of learning period when you bring them into your house. I found that they will kind of drop leaves when you bring them home and take a little while before they start having their little growth spurts. Yeah, these are much more subtle than a lot of alocasias. So if you're looking for something that's a little less showy, but also still has beautiful detail, this is definitely one. The deeper recesses of the leaves go to a regular like medium green. And then on in between the veining, you get that sort of greeny silver color, which is very nice. This one also kind of has a matte texture, but because of the dimension from the veins, it doesn't seem like it's matte because it kind of still has a little bit of like sheen and depth to it. So it's kind of like a nice hybrid between the two. But that one is the Alocasia Silver Dragon. The last two plants are the same plant, but I will show you both of them. This one I think definitely gives the Frydeck a run for its money as far as what my favorite Alocasia is. I can't honestly decide, but it is the Alocasia, woo! It is the Alocasia Silver Dragon. And this one is full on dripping on me. This is stunning. Holy cow, when I finally saw one of these in person, I lost my mind, honestly. They are so gorgeous. When I bought them, I ended up buying two because not only is it absolutely gorgeous, I thought it was also like a decent deal for the quality of the plants. And holy cow, I went through every single plant and inspected it like head to toe, like I was looking for like a prize mule or something or like judging a dog show. You'll notice this one is brown on the edge here, and that's just wear and tear from buying a new plant. I bought my dragon scales at the same time as the silver dragon, and I don't even have a favorite between the two, but I'll tell you at least why I love this one. It is because I've got a new growth point right here, and look at this, look at it. 
I've got a little pup on the way and I'm so excited. Um, this big old honkin' leaf right here is one that I grew. Yes, me, my conditions. Look at the size of this monster. Compared to the last two leaves, it's like twice the size, it's insane. But let me quick show you the other one. So this is the other one and you'll notice a similar pattern where these are the size of the leaves that preceded it and then boom, look at this. That is a friggin' monster, look at it. That right there is worth price of admission. Just, oh, look at you. Now this one you'll see, it's got a few more of these little babies that are browning. Those are of course the oldest leaves, so they will eventually fall off because it's just, that's the way things go. It doesn't have as much new growth as the other one, but it does have a little bump. I've got, you know, this big leaf right here is sort of pregnant, if you were. So there'll be another one coming soon, but holy cow. Now the one thing I do want to point out about these that are not quite so obvious is actually the back sides of the leaf Ugh, dripping. Yeah, check out the back sides of the leaves. The veins actually have like a deeper purple color, which is super interesting that the other ones don't have. The other ones have regular veins that are pretty much the same color as the back of the leaf. But this one, of course, has to be special and have that like reddy brown color on the back side. But look at this. Oh, can I make that a screensaver? Like that's insane just offensive. Now onto the care, I'm gonna start with watering. I mentioned before that I came into some problems on the Fridex because I was under watering. These plants are pretty sensitive to both over and under watering. I have not had any issues with over watering, but I would generally say compared to philodendrons and monsteras, these like to be watered a little bit more often. If you're someone who uses a moisture meter, I would say water it when it's at a three, maybe a four, but I like to water it before it gets down to a two. It seems to react a little bit better if it stays on the sort of wettest of dry that you can be. So it's still technically like in the dry section, but like barely, just barely. When I water, I use filtered water. I don't have to use distilled or anything fancy, but I do recommend using filtered as opposed to just straight up tap water. And when you water, I would water really thoroughly. Like flush it out, make sure it's sort of like raining out of the bottom of the pot and make sure you get everything wet. If you leave dry spots and things like that, it tends to be a little more antsy. I keep them pretty humid. So if you do decide to keep your humidity on the higher side, you might not have to water nearly as often because the soil will sort of stay damp, not damp, but moist longer if your humidity is higher. So I would say like I water my alocasias every week, like every seven days about then but that's only because my humidity is higher. So if you have your humidity at sort of regular 40%, I would say you'd probably have to water every five to seven days, something like that. How often you water will also be dependent on your soil composition. I'm gonna compare to say like a philodendron aeroid mix. I would say if you're making your own soil or you're doing like your own ratios, make your alocasia soil a little bit more on the coir side of things or the peat moss side of things and put a little less aerating mixture in there. Not a ton. I, I would just say go from like a 50-50 to maybe like a 60-40 with 40% being the aerating mix. Just like a little bit more just so it doesn't dry out too quickly. In conjunction with soil, uh, I'd say the roots are fairly hardy. So I would wait as long as possible to sort of up size your potting. Upsize your potting, what does that mean? I would wait a while before potting up to a new size. They really don't like all that extra soil and all that extra leg room. They really kind of like being more on the pot bound side of things. The other thing to know about alocasia roots is that these are tuber plants, I believe is what it's called, where, you know, it's basically a tuber at the bottom of the plant. You can kind of see it the best on this sort of spindly Frydac here. You can see how there's sort of little dots all along this base. This is basically a huge tuber, you know, kind of like a carrot or a turnip or something. It's very bulbous. 
and that is actually where they store a lot of their water. So one thing that can happen to alocasias is that they can die back to nothing. That happens if the plant goes dormant or if you underwater or overwater, you can lose, lose leaves very easily. So if that happens, don't get discouraged. Uh, water the soil like normal. So if it goes back to a bulb, you want to continue watering it as if it's still a plant. So you want to wait until the soil hits your three to four, and then you want to water again, just like normal. That will take a lot longer because it doesn't have, you know, leaves and stuff producing energy. So it won't be soaking up as much water when it's a bulb, but you should still be watering it and you're very likely going to get your plant back. Now for talking about leaf growth, I'm going to use the other fry deck because this one has a ton of growth on it that exemplifies a lot of these examples. Alocasias are known for dropping leaves really easily. It's very typical for these plants to go dormant and not grow any leaves during the winter months. And a lot of times you can lose leaves as well. And you can have a situation where it goes from a plant like this to a plant like this. That is very typical. It happens. It happens to the best of us. I water these two plants at the exact same time and this one just happened to be okay with it and survive, and this one happened to throw a hissy fit. It just happens. But let's say you have a plant like this and it is still doing pretty well, it didn't go dormant. When you have new leaf growth like this, it is gonna consume more water. So make sure you stay on top of watering even more so when it's producing leaves. And for my favorite part of alocasias is when they make babies. You'll see at the very bottom of this alocasia pot, there are little pups, three little clusters, one here, one here, and one in the front, of little Alocasia Frydeck pups. The growth pattern is actually very, very similar to Calathea, where they make little pups off to the side and new sort of sprouts coming through the soil, but it'll still grow off of the sort of bundle that's in the middle. Pups are very similar to how like Pilea peperomoides grows, Sansevieria, ZZ plants, they all have plants that kind of offshoot off the side. So if you do up like repot this and put it into a bigger pot or need to put new soil in it, you could separate out the babies and have them form their own plant. Another example of alocasias making pups is this one right here, my dragon scale. It's making a baby. Oh, I'm so excited. This little guy right here. I can't wait. I just can't wait. You know, it's got a growth here and it's also got a root he growth here. So that is generally how leaves grow. Humidity, I kind of touched on before, but you generally want to stay between 40 and 60%. They'll be perfectly fine in those conditions, which is fairly normal, maybe a little on the high side for certain environments. Of course, these could stand to be higher. I'm obsessed with all of my alocasia and I'm obsessed with their growth and longevity in this world. So I actually give them closer to 70%. They'll always appreciate more, but I'm a little extra, but 40 to 60% is plenty for these plants. Pests, everybody's favorite pests. Alocasias are susceptible to all the same pests that every other plant is. The one and only time I had thrips, it was actually on my cupria and it managed to survive having thrips just fine. I killed them off and everything seemed to be okay. I haven't seen any since then, so that's good. I will say they are spider mite prone. I just love my plants that thrive and live off of being sort of spider mite breeding zones. My Fridex especially get spider mites frequently. I actually treated them for spider mites, I wanna say like a month ago. So I actually, for the Fridex especially, I find that they are way more susceptible to bugs than even the other ones. So I will actually treat my Fridex like their Calathea. So when I go through and do my Calathea treatments that I always do, I do it for the fried eggs also, or at least I try to, because without fail, every time I forget to treat my fried eggs, they get spider mites. It's just what happens. They react a little better than Calatheas do. They rebound a little bit faster when you do find them and treat them for it, but they are kind of pest magnets. As far as light goes, 
pretty much all alocasia do pretty well in medium to bright indirect light. And I kind of touched on it before, but the Tiny Dancer, I feel like doesn't like bright indirect light. So this one, air on the side closer to medium, maybe medium to low and kind of adjust as needed. But I give this about medium-ish to low light and it likes it it likes it just fine. Because they have so few leaves a lot of the times, I really recommend cleaning off the leaves periodically to make sure that they photosynthesize as much as possible. Cleaning the leaves just kind of helps it photosynthesize more and therefore get you more leaves sooner, faster, all of that. So I recommend cleaning them off. Because I do my bug treatments on these on occasion, that's kind of my excuse to sort of treat for pests and clean it at the same time, and it seems to work really well. Temperatures, I would say typical, same as pretty much every other house plant, sort of room temperature, you know, your 60 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 to 25 degrees Celsius, somewhere in there. They do just fine in the temperatures I keep my house, so they do okay. Just don't let them get too insanely cold. As for fertilizing, full disclosure here, <laughs> I haven't quite mastered the amount I'm supposed to be fertilizing these plants. So for the time being, I'm erring on the side of under fertilizing, kind of like I do with my calatheas, because I had been accidentally over fertilizing literally every single one of my plants for a few months. I am over correcting and under fertilizing the sensitive plants I have, which is basically Calatheas, Alocasia, and Anthurium. So when looking at this plant, I know underwatering was a culprit, but I feel like I also lost leaves because I over fertilized. That's a hunch. I'm not 100% sure. I think underwatering was a bigger culprit because this soil mix is actually a lot airier than my other fry deck. So I think this one dried out a lot more quickly than the other one does. So I think it's more to do with underwatering, but I think it also had to do with my over fertilizing of this plant. Like I said, I, I'm still figuring it out, but like my ears on these ones, how they're starting to sort of like decay on me. Is that due to underwatering or is that due to over fertilization? When it comes to fertilization for alocasias, I would just err on the side of under. You can either do a quarter strength or an eighth strength like every other water. So that's what I'm gonna try to do from now on and hopefully alleviate a lot of the problems I've been seeing with these fried eggs. That is it for my alocasia video. It is impressive to me how much I love these. I will say if you're nervous about getting alocasias, they're kind of like, as far as difficulty goes, they're kind of the midpoint between a philodendron and a calathea where if you have calatheas and you're okay with calatheas, alocasias will be a cinch. If you only do philodendrons and you stay far away from calatheas and you've never had either anthurium or alocasia, I would just pick an alocasia that's more common. You know, you can pick up an amazonica or something like this. I have heard that amazonica is extremely difficult and even more difficult than most alocasia. So that's why I've never picked it up is because I've already got one that kind of looks like it and is treating me pretty well. Kind of avoided the Amazonica, but if you find something like a Tiny Dancer or any other kind of alocasia out there, pick one up. Because remember, even if it dies all the way back, you can still revive them and grow it from the bulb. I won't say that alocasias are my favorite, but I also won't say that they're not my favorite. They're pretty awesome. Thank you so much for watching my video. Hopefully you liked it. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you wanna see more from me and write a comment down below. If you own alocasia, what types do you have? Which alocasia would you get for yourself if you were buying one? Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you next time. Bye.